Hey everyone, welcome back to Policy Punchline. Here at the show, we interview scholars, policymakers, and business executives about some of the most urgent issues and frontier ideas in our world today. I'm Princeton senior Tiger Gao. Uh, today, I'm very honored to be joined by Tony Yosilov, who graduated from Princeton University in 1996 with a Bachelor of Arts from the School of Public and International Affairs. He then received a JD and MBA from Columbia University, where he was awarded the John M. Olin Fellowship in Law and Economics. He joined Davidson Kempner Capital Management in 1999 and became a managing member in 2004. Uh, Mr. Yusilov became the sole executive managing member and chief investment officer in January 2020. He is also a member of the Board of Trustees at Princeton University, the New York Public Library, and Leadership Enterprise for a Diverse America. He also serves on the investment committee of the New York Public Library and is a member of the Board of Directors of Princo, which stands for Princeton University uh, Investment Company, uh, which is the investment manager for the Princeton University Endowment. So, uh, Tony, thank you so much for joining me today on the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a great honor to have you on the show. As I was just saying, uh, it's the first time uh, we're back in the studio uh, since the pandemic happened last March, and uh, so so I'm very uh, excited it's, about it's this. It's very exciting to be talking to everyone live from campus. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. So so maybe we should start uh, all the way back when when you were a Princeton undergrad. Uh, how was the experience then, and uh, uh, what was it like to uh, be a Princeton graduate back then? Yeah, my, my experience at Princeton was um, was wonderful, yeah. um, which is not to say that every single portion of it was wonderful, but overall it was a great experience. I actually grew up um, down the road from here in East Brunswick, New Jersey, which is about half an hour away, and I didn't actually really seriously consider Princeton until my junior year of high school because it just felt so close to where I grew up. But as yeah. I got to know the university better, I was very excited to uh, uh, to be here. Um, and I would say there's a lot of things, and, and certainly being on campus, you know, br brings them back. I mean, the academic coursework here was amazing. I was, as you mentioned, in the School of Public and International Affairs, which really allowed me to look at a wide variety uh, of subjects. And I, and I think I still use some of what I learned um, from that education today. But because Princeton is a liberal arts school, I also got to take a lot of great courses in history and sociology. Actually, I took courses in the engineering uh, school as well in computer science and um, some advanced math. And so it was really a very uh, wide variety of education. You know, I also very much enjoyed my extracurricular uh, life here at Princeton. I ran track uh, my freshman year, which was a great experience. But then um, I realized it was only so far I was going to get with my running career. So, so that coupled with a, fr a freshman year um, injury, which kept me out of the cross-country season, uh, maybe decided I wanted to spend my, more of my time on other activities. So I was a member of the CPUC when I was here. I was an active member of WICLIO as well. And I was what was then called a residential advisor, which I think I has now got a different name. Residential uh, college advisor. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I, yeah. I, I was one of those as well. So o overall, it was a terrific uh, educational experience. And then you went to Columbia for, for JD MBA. Yeah. So I actually did a unique program that still exists today. So I actually um, stopped taking coursework at Princeton after my junior year and started taking coursework at Columbia. So for my senior year at Princeton, I lived off campus, which yeah. I know has been popular this year during COVID, <laughs> but actually wasn't a very popular thing in 1996. Yeah. So I lived in an apartment uh, uh, in one of the store tops on uh, uh, Nassau Street. I see. And I commuted to Columbia for my law school courses. And I lived in Princeton. And the one requirement I had left was to finish my senior thesis. And so it was really a very nice hybrid where I got to enjoy life in the city, but also enjoy my life at Princeton. Um, the benefit of that was once I was at Columbia, I decided to stick around for an MBA. So I initially applied to and got into the JD, the JD program, and it was only when I was there I decided to stick around for the MBA. And so I finished that entire experience in um, an additional three years beyond Princeton. Uh, so it saved me a year, uh, and it allowed me to begin my career, I would say, at a more advanced level um, when the program finished in uh, 1999. Was it somewhat common back then because it, you embarked a career in finance from a bachelor's degree focused on policy and international affairs, and then you went to do law? Uh, so wh why chose finance afterwards? You know, it's interesting. So I had two potential career paths in my mind when I left uh, Princeton. Um, one of them was going into a career in, of an investment management. So it wasn't that I was generally interested in finance. I was also very specifically interested in managing uh, money. So the early 1990s were really the first wave of yep. the mutual fund industry becoming yep. extremely uh, popular. So it was something that I 
learned a lot about when I was in school, not necessarily from the coursework, but from talking to friends and talking to uh, maybe a couple of friends whose parents were in this industry. Generally, they were nice enough to you know give, give me some time and help me learn about the um, the industry. Online trading just became a thing when we were at school. So you could actually buy and sell stocks um, on the computer. That may seem like ridiculously common today, but that actually was invented when we were in, uh, in school. And so that was one path I considered. Um, the second path I considered was going into regulatory um, law. And so obviously there was my work um, uh, at SPIA, but also at law school, um, I did an internship with the American Enterprise um, uh, Institute, which is one of the big think tanks uh, uh, in D.C. I took a lot of courses uh, at Columbia uh, relative to um, regulatory law. And, you know, when you're in law school, it's really the internship for your second summer that kind of yeah. impacts where you go work. And so I had offers from some firms in Washington, D.C. that would have taken me down the path of regulatory law. And I had some interviews um, with firms in New York that took me more down the path of, of corporate uh, law. And so I went down the path of corporate uh, law, had a great experience working in law, but realized fairly quickly I didn't want to be an attorney full time. And so that was when I decided to enter the MBA program at Columbia and really kind of shifted my focus back towards money management. And you initially joined uh, Davis and Kempner Capital Management as an intern while finishing your studies at Columbia, you just mentioned. Uh, what made you decide to go back there? Because I believe it was a fairly small firm at the time. Now it's uh, obviously a giant. But. It, you know, it's interesting. So um, so my, my second internship of, of my three in law was the one I just mentioned, and Davis and Kempner was the third um, internship. Um, and I took the internship because I knew a little bit about investing in troubled companies, actually from a course I had taken in law school on bankruptcy. It was one of the things that came up um, in that course, maybe like in one portion of one uh, section, but it kind of stuck, stood with me. And then it just seemed like a really interesting opportunity. It was a firm of maybe 15 people um, at most. The firm was managing over a billion uh, uh, dollars at the time. And... Um, you know, it, I thought it was a, a, a potentially a career in investment management that would use both my finance skills and my legal skills. And that was very appealing to me. And it still is today to be able to use both uh, skill sets. So being that it was a summer um, internship, I thought it was a very low risk way to try it out. Uh, and so first of all, I very much enjoyed what I was doing. And I very much enjoyed the people I was working uh, uh, with, some of whom I still work with today, uh, uh, by the way, or have worked with till very uh, recently with my lo uh, longtime partner, Tom Kempner, having just retired a couple of years ago. But um, I was going to say, in general, I like the people, I like the place. And then the other thing I realized was that um, sometimes it's hard to start where you want to wind up, right? So a lot of people, even at that time, would have said, you need, you need to work at a Wall Street bank before you can go work at a firm like Davidson Kempner. Um, but I had a firm like Davidson Kempner that was willing to hire me without working at a Wall Street bank. So I kind of thought, what was the point of going to work at the Wall Street <laughs> bank? I've already gotten to the yeah. point I'd start at, and I'd kind of figure it out along the way, uh, which fortunately I did. I'm not sure it's so easy to do today what I did in 1998 or 1999, but it was very effective for me in terms of jumpstarting my career. It, it seems that these days uh, a lot of students are saying if you know – have an idea of what you want to do, you should just go pursue it directly rather than thinking that you need to do five things in order to, to get there. So perhaps that might be your advice for, for young people these days. Yeah. So I, I was very helped by the fact, and again, this is, may be hard to believe in 2021, that, that what I was doing was a very unpopular career path in 1998 or 1999. So there wasn't massive competition to uh, uh, to do this. And so that might have been part of, first of all, why I was able to get a, a job because there weren't that many people with um, – pedigree similar to mine at the time who were looking to uh, uh, to do this, but it was also a fairly easy industry to get into. So the, the late 90s to take us back was kind of internet 1.0. And so a lot of my classmates from Columbia and classmates from Princeton were pursuing careers in, um, in technology, but really in the first wave of internet companies is what I mean by technology. Um, and um, if they weren't doing that, they were doing more traditional career paths like investment banking or consulting. And so I think for a lot of people, it, it is actually good to get those levels of experience, but but I don't think it's always necessary to, to succeed. Maybe we could talk a little bit about uh, Davis and Kempter because uh, you said back then it was only 15 people when you joined with $1 billion of asset management, uh, under management, and now it's like $36 billion uh, AUM. So it's it's obviously grown a lot over the years. What were some of the highlights and, and lowlights uh, throughout those years? 
Yeah, you know, I, I would say a couple of things. First of all, I don't think there was a plan or maybe even a dream of when I yeah. got there and we were at a billion dollars to get to $36 billion. I would say it was a stream of steady progressions over, um, you know, at this point it would be a 23 or 24 year uh, period to get there versus one giant jump that did it. I mean, there were, there were points in time that were inflection uh, points for our organization. So, for example, when I got there in the late 1990s, we only had two investment strategies, which were risk arbitrage and distressed debt. Um, and both of those strategies were in the process of becoming much more popular. Um, and risk arbitrage in particular is a cyclical strategy where um, when there are a lot of mergers, it's a very good strategy. But when there aren't a lot of mergers, it's just there are fewer things that you can invest in in the, uh, in the strategy. So, I would say one of the first big things that we did, which was probably in the early 2000s, was divert, diversify the number of strategies that we that we had. So we built out a convertible arbitrage strategy. We built out a long short equity strategy. Later on, we built out a long short credit uh, strategy. And even within both distressed debt and risk arbitrage, um, we massively widened the number of things that we were uh, uh, doing. So we launched a, a new distressed debt hedge fund in 2005. It was only distressed debt, but it was more fulcrum type securities versus uh, top of the capital structure, which is probably what we were known for at that time. We launched a private equity style distressed uh, fund in 2000. Um, uh, 11, that business is now um, maybe just under a quarter of our assets. And so, and that's been a substantial portion of our growth over the last uh, uh, decade. And so there were certainly things that um, that helped, but I think each step of the way, it was more about looking one or two steps uh, forward versus maybe uh, five or 10 years ahead that, that got us there. Uh, so you spoke at a Milken Institute panel back in 2019 on the topic of creating and sustaining a culture of excellence. And maybe we can talk a little bit about um, uh, Davidson Kempner and, and your uh, management style there. What, what do you think that makes uh, Davidson Kempner unique amongst the other alternative assets managers out there? Well, you know, I would mention a couple of things. You know, f f first of all, we, we are still a private partnership. Um, there aren't that many private partnerships left on Wall Street. There are some, but it's certainly not as popular as it used to be. So in the 19... Um, 80s, many of the Wall Street firms like Bear Stearns or Goldman Sachs were private partnerships. And one by one, most of them went public or monetized over time. So Davidson Kempner is 100% owned um, by its working partners and some of our retired partners who are on an earn out of their shares. So eventually, retired partners do give back all of their shares to the, uh, the working uh, partners. And so that's very powerful in terms of the culture when it's really uh, you versus an outside shareholder. Um, I'd also say, you know, we've made a lot of effort to be a really nice place to work, to make sure we treat everybody the way we would want to be treated ourselves. I, I think it really matters. You know, when, when you do the um, the math on it, you know, you spend as much time with your working colleagues, in many cases, more time than you spend with your loved ones outside of work, right? And so, you know, I'll go back to kind of where I started as to why I wound up staying at Davidson Kempner. I, I don't think it's just about, like, finding a career that's, like, intellectually uh, stimulating and satisfying. I think you also need to find one with people that you you like, that you respect, that you want to spend time with. It doesn't mean they need to be um, your best friends, but it does mean that professionally they have to be people that you're excited to go to work with and be teammates um, with, and that's very important. And and you know we've never um, lost sight of that at Davidson Kempner, no matter how big that we've gotten. Um, and I hope that we continue to grow, but I hope that we also never lose sight of that very important part of it. I mean, there's different models of hedge fund culture. We are very much a teamwork-based culture. And so I would say for people to succeed at DK, they have to want to be on the team. You know, um, There are different cultures of hedge funds that are more star-based cultures, and it's kind of an amalgamation of, of, of stars. Um, and that works very well for, for those cultures, but that's not what our culture is. Um, is. And so it was something that, that, that's really been a focus ever since I got um, to the firm. And so it predates uh, me. Uh, and, you know, I'm very excited to help be one of the, be one of the keepers of the flame. Uh, you, you mentioned that it's a working partnership and uh, it's obviously growing in size. Would you mind giving an, us an idea of, of the size of the firm right now? How many people there, there, there are? How many offices across the globe? Yeah. So we have um, 13 partners. We have about 400 people. Um, we have five offices currently around the globe. We have offices in New York and London, um, which are our two main investing offices in Hong Kong. Uh, and then we've got smaller offices in Philadelphia and in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, and we're in the process of opening up an office in Shenzhen. Wow. Just a lot of places across the globe. 
Yeah. Uh, it, 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 it is. I've, I've, I've spent time at all of them other than our office in, uh, in Shenzhen. Yeah. Uh, that, that was something that uh, probably got delayed a little bit by the yeah, uh, pandemic, COVID, yeah. but, it, but is full steam ahead um, at this point. So I hope to be able to make it to that office uh, it, reasonably soon. Wonderful. Uh, you, uh, so Davis and Kempner recently underwent a leadership transition, and 2021 was your first year uh, as the sole executive managing uh, member. Uh, 2020 was my first year. 2020, yeah. sorry. Uh, I guess just to kind of look back on this unprecedented year because given the pandemic, and maybe we could start from the beginning of the transition. How was the transition process, and, and uh, what's it like to uh, to be uh, the, the sole executive member? Well, I mean, the, the transition is something that we worked on over several years, right? So uh, Tom Kepner, my, my business partner, was almost 67 by the time he retired, and he was you know, excited by Davidson Kempner, but ready to do other things with his um, his life outside of uh, of this job. And it's really a full time job in this, right? And so I became the co head of our firm at the beginning of 2018. Um, it wasn't necessarily definitive at that point that I would become the sole head two years later, but the idea was to have a, a, an orderly transition where we could do it together. He could pass off responsibilities for a long time. I was the um, the deputy managing partner of the firm for five or six years before that, and so it really was a full apprenticeship in in terms of the leadership of our um, of our firm, and it allowed me to take on responsibilities gradually over time as opposed to suddenly. Um, I think that was very valuable under any circumstance, but it proved to be even far more valuable during a pandemic, right? You know, w- one of my jokes is that um, you know when Tom. Uh, graduated, which was how he described his uh, retirement from Davidson Kempner, um, he didn't leave a playbook as to how to deal with a global pandemic. Um, and so, you know, March 2020 w- was difficult, right? And so there was a model in my head for how to deal with a financial crisis, right? I had guided um, a large portfolio through the global financial crisis in uh uh, 2008 and 2009. I had been at Davidson Kempner during the long-term capital uh, crisis in uh, 98. I had been with the firm um, during Enron and some of the, yeah. the U.S. stock market crashes between 2000 and 2002. I had run the portfolio during the European crisis in 2011, yeah. um, the uh, debt, debt crisis in 2015, 2016. So I had seen a lot of um, financial crises. And, and I'm a student of history, so I could talk about, you know, 1972 to 1974 in the U.S. and other periods of time uh, reasonably intelligently. Um, but, you know, how to deal with a global pandemic is not really something that anyone had a playbook for, right? And even if you um, were to go back to 1918, which I don't think actually was that valuable in this case, there was no Zoom in 1918, yeah. right? So some of the functionality that we had to manage a business um, remotely in that um, era uh, didn't exist then and exist today, right? So I think as a society, we were all kind of making it up as we went along, uh, uh, so to speak, right? And so the HR issues of getting everybody out of our offices safely and working from a work at home uh, environment in March of last year, starting to repopulate our offices in June of 2000, uh, uh, 20. How do you order bringing people back into the uh, office, etc.? Th- those were all very challenging issues, and and they're very emotional issues uh, uh, too. And also having a little bit of flexibility and allowing different regions in the globe to take different approaches based upon what was going on in that region in that period of time was also very uh, important. And so, um, I would hope to think that I would have handled it just as well if I had just been plopped into the job. Um, but I think the reality is that having a several year lead up into getting into the into the position um, was actually very, very helpful. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm grateful uh, for that. So you mentioned the during the Milken panel that people want different things from their workplace than they wanted 10 years ago. They wanted different things today compared to 10 years ago. Could you talk a little bit more about this, basically how the notion of what it means to be an employee and employer changed over the years, and especially during this uh, pandemic, the work from home culture? Well, I, I think that there is just more of a mix between work and life outside of work in 2021. And this, this is not related to the pandemic um, than there would have been in the 1990s. I, I hate to say it. I think it starts with mobile phones and, you know, what were Blackberries and then became uh, uh, iPhones, where it's just too easy to access people um, 24-7. And so people wind up being 
access, accessed, excuse me, more uh, frequently than they would uh, like. And so, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we've got a culture of teamwork and, and a culture where I'd like to think that people like to work with their teammates and be um, together. But we also have a culture where there's more of a blend of work-life balance than there used to be uh, uh, previously. And so we've made a lot of effort at our firm to make sure that we've kept up with that, right? You know, as a financial services organization, we can provide certain things like, you know, meals or subsidized gym memberships or things along those times. But it, but it's all about actually making sure that people do have some downtime, um, which I think is very, very important um, in an era where it's sometimes hard to have downtime if you're not mentally disciplined enough to give yourself that down uh, time, right? No, none of us can run this like life is a marathon. It's not a sprint, right? None, none of us can run full speed all the time. And I actually find for investing in particular, you sometimes need to let your mind wander to have the creativity come up with the best answers. And so n not only is it um, not productive, it's actually counterproductive. And so, you know, a lot of what we've done is to find ways for people to get some of those benefits and some of those experiences um, through the workplace. You know, we're not a workplace that, that, that expects or even really wants people to come to the office on the weekends. So we have very few people in our offices on the weekends and the extent that people need to work on the weekends, which is occasionally, but not often they can do so from uh, from home. Uh, but it's making sure that people have the, that combined balance, I think is very important. But I, but I go back to, you know, we all need downtime. Uh, mental health is a very important uh, thing. Even, even before the pandemic, when people were stuck in front of their Zoom screens all day, it was just too easy to have your your um, your mobile phone be the last thing you check at night, the first thing you check in the morning, to feel constant pressure to respond to emails or text or whatever. It's actually very helpful to go out, see life, see what's going on. It, like it makes you a better investor. Uh, I think this work from home thing also uh, uh, dampened the morales in certain financial services firms that we we, we saw. Uh, Goldman Sachs and a lot of the investment banks were talking, debating whether when to bring back their employees. And a lot of the big tech companies have announced that they can do a permanent work from home. So what, what is Davidson Kempner's kind of decision on, on work from home and, and where you see the future uh, on that front? So we've had a lot of success, actually, in bringing people back to the office. Um, and I think there's been there's been multiple parts of that. First of all, we staged it over a period of a few months. We didn't try to bring everyone back a, at once. Secondly, we bent over backwards to make sure that we had all the health and safety precautions well beyond what the law required in place to make that work. So, you know, we previously had a reasonably spaced out office at DK where people were not sitting within six feet of each other to begin with. We checkerboarded our trading floor, so now no one's sitting within 11 feet or 12 feet. Yeah. Um, of each other. We require people to wear masks in all places except for at their desk or um, uh, in an office. Uh, that way people feel safe in the office. And this is in New York. It's different in different um, other, each region has its own uh, cadence to it based upon what the um, local feeling uh, uh, is there. We order in lunch for everyone every day. Uh, you know, we, um, there's no communal food or anything like that in the office to prevent uh, germ spreading uh, that way. We really, really worked hard on it. And we made sure we had the best HIPAA filters uh, employed. I really do think air circulation is very important uh, as well. We, we made sure that we had really, really good air circulation in our office uh, before we let anyone uh, come back in. And so th those are the things I think that really mattered. The reality is that people really do work, enjoy working with each other. Um, I think the teamwork is better. I think all the, the handoffs, the uh, impromptu conversations are very difficult to happen over Zoom. But we also have only been requiring people to come in three days a week. And so we've been trying to balance people's needs in the office with people's needs outside the office. Um, we're going to go to four days a week for our investing team starting after Labor Day and three to four days a week for our back office, depending upon the role starting after Labor Day. I think there's also been a realization during this that you can be just as effective without having to be there 100% of the time, right? So we were an organization where while we did um, many things for our people in terms of work-life balance, we actually weren't big on working remotely pre-pandemic. Um, and, and I would say, and I was one of those people who would have believed that, that I think four days a week is fine, right? Um, I think giving everyone one day a week to kind of deal with what they need to deal with at home and work remotely, you'll still get virtually all the benefits of being uh, in person while still having, you know, let's say the mental health benefits of being uh, at home. And so I'm very excited uh, for that structure going forward. And, and based on what I've seen so far, I think it's going to work very well. Uh, most of our conversations so far have been 
uh, about you thinking about, about your management style rather than about investing per se. So I guess my, my next question would be between your, your time, how do you divide up your time between thinking about management, firm culture, how to shape things on that front versus uh, investment? It seems that you spend a lot of your time thinking about culture. Yeah, I would, I would say there's uh, three main places I spend my time. Uh, investing would be the number one place I spend my time. Uh, I spend a lot of time with our clients uh, as well. Obviously, that's been more difficult during the, uh, the pandemic, so it's been uh, primarily over Zoom uh, since then, although I expect that's going to uh, revert to in-person reasonably soon um, as well. And then um, I spend time running the firm. Uh, I'm fortunate that we've got a great infrastructure and a number of very uh, uh, good people who help uh, me to run the firm. And so I have the luxury of being able to think more about policy and bigger picture uh, issues and a little bit less about uh, some of the smaller issues. I certainly do get in the weeds of those um, as well. But we are an investing organization. Uh, I am the chief investment officer of our firm as well. And so that is the area I do spend the most of my time. Before we wrap up this uh, section, I guess to just to quickly go back to the transition process, I, I guess another question that I did not get to previously ask was, uh, how do you see the tension between uh, uh, taking over from a, a founder-led uh, firm, where, where you know the, the name is Davidson Kempner, sort of taking it from taking over from the founders and transition to that process? What would be some of the advice uh, you, you give to people? Because, uh, for example, Bridgewater is also going through a transition process. As, Ray Dalio leaving, and you know, and- I would I would say a couple of things. First of all, um, we had actually been through two transitions, and so there's a Davidson and Davidson Kempner as well. And and Marvin Davidson was actually the head of the firm when I got there, uh, and Tom did not take over until 2004. So I actually got to see the transition between Marvin and Tom, what worked, what didn't um, work, and and Tom obviously saw it too and, and lived it because he was the deputy managing partner um, before he became the head of the firm, and so that was very helpful. In, in, in the transition between Tom and I going on. Look, at, at one point there was a Goldman and a Sachs at Goldman yeah. Sachs, right? And now it's just a, j- just a name. My, my children are huge fans of The Office, right? There's a Gundler and a Mifflin too at some point, right? So uh, at yeah. some point you move, uh, you, you do move um, beyond those uh, things. Um, I will say it's very helpful if the founder wants to retire. Um, there's a lot of founders who don't want to retire. Yeah. There, there are people who... Uh, think they're going to live forever and, and yeah. adopt that uh, mentality. Sadly, I don't think any of us are going to uh, be, be in that circumstance. And so you have to be willing to move on. That That's part of it, right? So it's not just, I think, about the person who was in my seat taking the reins of responsibility. I think the person before them has to allow that to, um, uh, uh, to happen. But, you know, I try to be um, very respectful of our past. We have a number of retired partners. I spend a lot of time uh, uh, with them. I try to educate the people who come to Davidson Kempner about the past behind them so we can all learn from the uh, uh, past. But you have to also be um, respectful of the future as well, right? You know, we're going to succeed or fail in the next 10 years based upon what we do in the next 10 years. You know, what we did in the prior 30 years is only going to get us so far um, uh, uh, with the transition. I mean, all organizations go through this at some point or another. So I think the sooner you start thinking about it, uh, the better, but you know, not not all founders want to do that. So, you mentioned the next ten years. So maybe a great follow up would be uh, your preference to hire junior employees rather than pursuing c- senior hires. I know you uh, personally have talked about how Davidson Kempner is very proud of uh, building uh, a, a place uh, of growth from within and making sure people f- uh, come in at an early level and learn all the skill sets and the culture of Davidson Kempner and, and grow from it. Would you mind talk a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, and I mean, to be clear, right, so so we've made very successful hires at both junior levels and more senior levels, right? We do sometimes hire more senior experienced employees when um, – They've got a specific skill set that we need that we think we can't grow organically, right? But my general approach to building our business is we have the luxury of time, right? If it takes us a little bit longer to build something internally, we might actually build it better than trying to hire someone externally and build. It doesn't always work that way, but sometimes it works that way. And so there's many um, ways to be a great investor, um, but you have to be willing to work within the framework of where you are. Like I would say, as an example, being a great uh, investor in troubled companies is very different than being a great venture capitalist, right? And so I'm not sure the same person actually would be capable of doing both things. And so we want to attract people that we think would be good in the specific disciplines that we're hiring them for, and then to train them in our system as to how we do that sort of investing, right? And so it's a combination of people who are 
um, have the raw, let's just say, uh, firepower to become that level of investor, but also have the personality and the disposition uh, both to, to work within our framework and, and to work within our team, right? And it's a smaller subset of people. And so the problem sometimes is if someone's been an investor for a long period of time elsewhere, they might have the DNA of that other organization really imprinted in them. And that can work, but it doesn't have to work. Sometimes people are willing to change, but a lot of times people are not willing to change how they um, think about things, right? And so that's really the importance of, of hiring people at, at earlier levels of their career. Th that being said, we have had quite a few successes of people coming at later points in their career too. So I wouldn't want people to think that's the only way that we've done hiring, but we, 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 we have had a lot of people uh, started Davis and Kempner in the first five or six years of their career and then not leave. Stayed on. Yeah. Davis and Kempner is your only job, I believe. It is my so. only full-time <laughs> job. So. That's amazing. Yeah. 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 And, and what about competing with other financial services firms or fintech or the big tech companies? Do you feel like you're, you're competing for talents these days? It depends upon the area, right? So we have quite a few technology professionals on our team uh, uh, versus what we would have had a decade ago. And so when we're hiring technology uh, professionals, um, we're not, we, I'm sorry, we are competing with, you know, Facebook, Google, yeah. the startup of the day, uh, whatever it is, right? And a lot of the skill sets that our technology professionals have are malleable, right? And they could be programmers at those organizations like they're programmers uh, 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 for us, right? And so uh, we do try to make sure we're competitive in that regard. In the investing world, it's a little um, different. You know, yes, we are uh, competitive with investment banks for talent. And yes, we are competitive with um, other uh, money management organizations for talent. But I, I feel very good about what we have to offer as an organization, and, and I feel that's a very uh, fair fight. Like, we're going to attract more than our fair share of people uh, when that's the competition. I will say that um, I think there are many fewer uh, people who are interested in going into finance as a career today than there were 25 or 30 um, uh, years ago. I'm not sure that's a bad thing, yeah. uh, 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 by the way. We might, we might have been over-indexed to people going into finance uh, in, in, in the past, and it might be more balanced uh, today. Uh -huh. I still think that there are – many very talented people who want to go into finance. And so I don't think there's any struggle with hiring great people. But, but I will say, you know, even just talking to people on campus, um, you know, the, uh, Google, Facebook didn't exist, right, in 1996. Uh, 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 Microsoft certainly existed at that period of, of time. But even in 1996, Microsoft was a very big company. Um, yeah. And so, um, uh, you know, it's just it, there's just a different appeal you know, pe people will talk about going to work at those firms today like they would have talked about going to work at Goldman Sachs yeah. uh, in that era, right? So, um, you know, I, I, I will say I think, I think that's, that's not a bad thing. It's, it's, it's a good thing probably for society um, overall. And there's also many more um, people coming from places like Princeton who want to go into service careers straight yeah. out of school, which was very uncommon uh, in my era and is much more common today. That's also a great thing for, uh, uh, for society. So, again, I, I, I think that we actually do – uh, directly and indirectly compete with the big tech firms for talent in, yeah. in all these ways. But some of it is also who's in the funnel to begin with, because, yeah. you know, w w once you make a career choice to, to go into technology, you may never come back to finance. So, so last question for, for this section. Uh, what do you look for when you make hires, either especially for young people? I guess students might uh, often seek advice from you. Yeah, I, I think people have to be true to themselves, right? So there's no, like, one specific uh, thing that we look for in the interview process. Like, there's no one personality trait or, or secret sauce. You know, we do do case studies for all of our finance uh, professionals. And so, you know, you have to be able to basically uh, uh, pass what I'm going to call as, like, a real-world aptitude <laughs> yeah. uh, test uh, in, 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 in doing it. But, uh, you know, I look to people who are true to themselves, you know, also people who are very passionate about what they're doing. You know, to, to some degree, like, you, you have to want to do it, right? And so there's only so far or so hard you can drive yourself if you don't legitimately like what you're doing. And so um, trying to find people who are very passionate about um, what they're doing day in and day out and, and, and that they're going to sustain that for a long period of time is really um, – is really helpful. But, you know, I know that there are people that we meet who um, may not fit in our organization, but will work great in another yeah. organization. And I, and I think part of um, interviewing is trying to find that great fit um, where things work well between both the person who's being hired and the organization. And, and again, you know, it's a big world. There's a lot of different cultures. There's a lot of different personalities 
out there. I think there is something for everybody. Um, but you know, for us, it's you know trying to find people who will fit with our organization. So, so Tony, maybe we should talk a little bit about investing as well, especially some of the uh, very interesting market movements uh, t over the past few few months, uh, both during the pandemic and as we gradually transition out of the pandemic. Uh, we, we've seen quite a bit of this uh, event-driven movement in the market over the course of the past year. We've also seen the stock market return to pre-pandemic levels. So m maybe uh, the first very general question uh, from me would be, how, how do you think the stock market have evolved over the past few months? Uh, what, what are some of your overall takes? Uh, yeah, I think it's it's helpful to go back to the, to the start of the pandemic yeah. and the reaction to the pandemic, right? And, and I think there were a couple of things that went on, let's just say in the financial markets in general, in, in really March of 2020, although there were glimpses of it at the end of February and maybe a little bit in April as well. I think there was a massive overestimation of how deep the financial crisis was going to be caused by the pandemic. Uh, and, and I think there was a portion of that which was that people didn't know, and there was a portion of that that might have been geographic where you know there are major centers of finance in both New York and California, uh, and those were regions that were both particularly hit hard by the financial crisis, and those were both regions that probably locked down and shut down more than most of the rest of the United States did in that period of time. Um, I think maybe by May, it started to become more clear, although there were certainly people who understood before then that the crisis was not going to be nearly as deep uh, or, quite frankly, as evenly distributed um, as people thought it was going to uh, uh, be. And so that's when you really started to see wide scale buying uh, in the markets. And then I would say there's been a couple of other themes that, that have happened. Um, first of all, there's been this shift between investments that are um, work from home related yeah. uh, and investments that are recovery um, uh, related at different periods of time. I would also say there's been a massive amount of speculation that's returned to the financial um, markets, and you've seen it in all sorts of different pockets in the financial uh, uh, markets as well. You can actually see it in things like baseball cards uh, as well, some of which have like quadrupled in price over this period of uh, non fungible uh, tokens. Uh, non -fungible, <laughs> non fungible tokens would be an, all, an also a great example. Um, so there's many different ways this has, this has materialized besides in the financial. Uh, uh, markets and, and you can have different theories as to why that's the case, but the reality is that it is the um, the case uh, 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 out there. Um, but you know, we found it to be a very fruitful investing environment uh, throughout. You know, what we're doing today is is very different than what we were doing 12 months ago at this time in terms of our investing uh, uh, program. But I think you really hit on the head, which is event driven investing. Uh, and if you look at the overlay. Of, of our firm, Davidson Kempner, it is event-driven investing. So in each of our different areas that we invest in, we look for events and, and, and catalysts in terms of how we're going to get from point A to point B in making our investing uh, uh, return. Um, and this is an incredibly fruitful environment for event-driven investing. And I actually think it's going to continue to be uh, an a, a incredibly fruitful environment for event-driven uh, uh, investing as, as we come out of this. Um, and, and that could continue for a while. Uh, I think it, is, it likely is going to continue for a while. How would you define, for example, an event? I guess a lot of people might group you know, the COVID pandemic as one big broad event. But I guess from your perspective, there were multiple stages, multiple specific things you look for. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think there, there's a lot of um, many events that are buried within the bigger yeah. event of, um, of the pandemic. So, for example, there's a boom in residential housing going on uh, right now, like an, a an absolute boom. If you if you try to buy a house basically in most suburbs in the United yeah. States, uh, things are really busy. Even in New York City, where people thought that real estate was going to be left for dead, it's actually pretty busy yeah. uh, in residential um, in residential real estate. And so if you go back and look, you can make an argument that the U.S. has been underbuilding houses for a decade. Um, if you look at the rate of production of new uh, single family homes in the U.S., it was far greater pre-financial crisis than it was post-financial crisis. We were probably overbuilding homes maybe in the middle of the 2000s era, but the, the rate at which we were um, overbuilding homes was uh, uh, you know, much um, less than the rate probably at which we underbuilt homes for a decade since then, and there are demographic trends and people, you know, being in more multifamily housing and wanting to live more in cities, and that seems to be reversing back uh, at the moment um, as well. That could lead into it, but the reality is that all of a sudden, 
um, the United States is massively short housing. Uh, and the way that's solved is to build more housing, right? And so, um, you know, that's just like one tiny thing, but th there's a lot of things that are left to play out, you know, um, shutting down the, um, uh, the country during COVID um, was very messy, but it was also very quick. Uh, reopening the country is likely to take take far longer. Uh, there there are many uh, ebbs and flows that are going to happen along the way. Th there are a lot of things people don't really know the answer to yet, but are speculating on. For example, you know, our movie theater is going to look exactly the same post COVID as what they looked like pre uh, uh, COVID, and it will just take time to figure those things out. And so, for our uh, business, that's very powerful. Um, I'd also say that uh, M and A was kind of put on hold for yeah. a year um, during this. There's a portion of that where I, I can understand that boards weren't interested in doing uh, deals during COVID. Yeah. There were also portions of that where you know a lot of times before deals get struck, management teams meet each other, spend time with each other, get to know each other, sort of figure out if there's a good cultural fit between companies. That was very difficult to happen for most of 2000. From my understanding, is a lot of that stuff has returned um, as well. And so it just takes time for these things to happen. But you had a very busy merger wave from 2015, 16 through 2000. Uh, 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 19 that basically came to a grinding halt in 2020. So it makes sense that mergers have uh, you know picked up again uh, uh, quite a bit. How how did you feel? I guess exactly uh, sitting in the room back in March, seeing the stock market kind of falling. I mean, was it at all clear to you that we were going to kind of get out of this just fine after the Fed announced that they would support the markets and so on? Or, or did you feel like there was a chance that things would really go bad? Um, uh, I thought that um, I was less concerned about the decline being as deep as it was. Um, I... You know, look, it's it's uh, it wasn't shocking to me with the Fed support because I had lived through 2008. Uh, and I think the lesson of 2008 was probably the Fed support didn't come soon enough um, in, in that era. You know, I would say that um, Lehman Brothers was allowed to fail. Um, it didn't necessarily have to fail. Uh, th there was this belief that there would almost be deterrence um, from Lehman Brothers failing uh, in that era. And then um, when AIG almost fell the week uh, afterwards, that was like, okay, we have to actually finally step in and and solve uh, uh, and, and solve things, right? And so the uh, the regulators in 2020, while they had never lived through a pandemic, they did have the benefit of seeing what worked and what didn't work in 2008, and so they they stepped in and they stepped in very uh, aggressively. Um, whether they needed to or not, only time, like, you no way to answer that question, but it's unquestionable that it was very effective. Um, I guess from, from my perspective, um, as an investor, I wasn't relying upon that for success, but I always knew in the back of my head it was a possibility that we would get it and that we would get it sooner than you would think. Um, from my perspective, people were massively overestimating the amount of the damage fairly early. And the price drop in the securities that we were trading in was so dramatic so quickly that um, it just felt like a great buying opportunity. But um, as a distressed debt investor, you have to be willing to buy things when no one else wants to. Like That's the whole point of distressed debt <laughs> investing is to buy things that no one else wants to buy. And so you have to be willing to be a little bit uh, contrarian in that. And so we were. You know. In, in some way, do you feel like the Federal Reserve almost fulfilled the role of a distressed, distressed debt investor? Well, I think that. I think the issues that they were seeing were, um, look, the investment grade markets never uh, stopped, right? But the spreads that investment grade companies were borrowing at um, got to be a little wide. And then maybe the very low end of the investment grade curve had a harder time borrowing. Now, if you go back to uh, 2008, 2009, there were investment grade companies that uh, were borrowing at very high single digit rates of return in that period of time, which seems crazy with the benefit of, of, of hindsight, but, but that's out there, right? Yeah. So if you think about the role um, of, of the Fed, one of it is to maintain an orderly economy, right? And so um, I, I, I think it was, it was warranted what they did, right? I think that there were some signs before they came in of stability, but if again, if you think about their role in, in our society, I, I, I think that um, 
it's hard to second guess the decision and the decision i think worked out very well in terms of uh in, in terms of stability you know with where we are today with the amount of speculation in the market um you know that that we have to uh, we have to say you know if interest rates go up right and, and they may they may have to go up if inflation uh, really rears its uh, head that would be another obvious way to kind of slow things down in um, in speculation but but when I see some of the speculative things out there you know I think it will be fairly obvious with hindsight that they were speculative it, does, it doesn't mean that you can't make money in some of them it just means that it will be fairly obvious that um, there's been froth in portions of the market. Maybe we could talk a little bit about the froth uh, in the portions of markets. Do you think markets have become a little bit more detached from f- fundamentals because of the Federal Reserve's liquidity support uh, and, and so on? Do- well, I mean, you know, I think you have to take a step back, right? It, it, there's no right price for stocks to trade at, right? So if you assume a company is going to make money someday, which is, which is an if, right? You know, in theory, um, you know, it's a discounted series of cash flows, right, that you're buying into, but what's the right rate of return on that discounted series of cash flows, right? A, por- a portion of that might be your assumption on interest rates, but a portion of that is the spread above which you're willing to pay for that. And, you know, I think I mentioned, um, you know, earlier in the interview that um, when I got to uh, Princeton in the uh, 1990s, that was, you know, the, the big boom in the mutual fund industry, right? And so that was the first democratization of buying stocks, right? And so, it was a big deal, and this happened around the time when I was at school, where you could go online and, and buy a stock. And by the way, you had to have an internet connection, which not everyone had back then. You had to have a dial-up modem to dial in, and it was very slow and cumbersome to, to do that, right? Now, you fast forward to 2020, you can download a Robinhood app in yeah. you know, a relatively short period of time, <laughs> own a fractional share of a stock. Yeah. You know, these are very big changes, right? And so it may not be crazy that the more people you have in the market, the lower the expected yield is right and so you know the question is over time um uh what um what's going to have been the right rate right there's going to be plenty of of stocks or companies or nfts or whatever it is out there that go to zero but there'll there'll be other ones that do very well you know i i mean the um 1999-2000 was an incredibly speculative time in the markets incredibly speculative but you know i i went and looked out of curiosity you know if you bought amazon at the most expensive price that you could have paid for it in 1999-2000, you paid about $100 a share uh, uh, for it. If you bought it at the cheapest price in that era, you would have paid closer to a dollar a share. But at the most expensive price, you paid $100 a share. It's a $3,500 stock today. So you, you, you did pretty well, right? There are other companies that also have turned into very good companies that you still would have lost a lot of money in from the price that you paid in that era. But that happens to be one that you did well. You know, If you want to go back another generation, there was a big wave of companies in the early 1970s that were the darlings of that stock market. They were called the Nifty 50. Yeah. Um, and um, if you bought the Nifty 50 in 1972 and you sold it in 1974, you got creamed. Um, but if you held it till today, you've actually done pretty well. And the reason you've done pretty well, despite the fact that companies like Kodak, uh, which is a shell of itself, or Kmart, which is a shell of itself, um, didn't do well, is because of Walmart. And Walmart did so well over that period of time that it more than made up for the losses in these other uh, uh, in these other companies. And so, you know, what what is speculative in any different era remains to be seen. But if you find the right quality asset. You know, you could still do very well over a long period of time, even if you pay the highest price in a speculative era. I I, I remember watching YouTube yesterday. I was I I think Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger during their annual shareholder meeting, which was just taking place in Los Angeles right now, and they, they were saying how uh, this quote unquote democratization of finance, how Robin Hood. Uh, basically, Robinhood's business model in some way immoral because they're basically taking advantage of of this this uh, gambling kind of mindset, this this retail boom, and, and making money off off of this. And they don't think this is a good development of where the finance industry should be headed. Uh, do you have any thoughts on on the speculative well, behavior? Well, I, I I would divorce the um the the making it easier to buy stocks, which I view as a good thing yeah. for society from encouraging gambling in the stock markets, which I would, I would view as a bad um, as a bad thing, right? I think it make, yeah. making it indi- easier for individual people uh, to make smart financial uh, decisions and, and say own stocks, which over time should do better than saying keeping cash in your in your bank account. Like that, that's a good thing. It's kind of, I think it's kind of hard to be upset uh, uh, about that. I, I remember 
um, you know, uh, Berkshire Hathaway stock is now around four hundred thousand dollars a yeah. share. But maybe when it was closer to a couple thousand dollars uh, a share, they actually had to issue B shares in Berkshire because there were people who had the idea of basically having trusts that just held the Berkshire Hathaway shares and uh, dividing them up into parts. And they didn't like that idea. So they had to actually go to the, the B shares, <laughs> yeah. which are now one thirtieth or something like that of a Berkshire share. So they're still very expensive on a, uh, yeah. on a per share uh, basis, right? So allowing people to buy Google shares in, in fractions where they're yeah. $120, that's a good thing. That's not, that's not a bad a thing in, in my mind, but but you know, investing is investing, right? And people should know they could lose all their money in investing, yeah. or if you you take out leverage, whether it's by using options or through margin lending, that you could lose all of your money. Those those are very important things for people to understand as as well. So I, th I think that part's important. But I think democratizing uh, investing and allowing. Um, all uh, people in this country to be able to plan for their future and to uh, plan for their savings, I view as very positive. I see. I think there was a common sentiment during the pandemic of the you know markets only go up, uh, stocks only go go up, uh, and there was a lot of t t tweets and memes about these things. Do you do you, do you think we're in a somewhat structurally different era today because of uh, you know the quote unquote global savings cloud? There's so much savings. There's so much uh, debt. We're in structurally lower interest rates. There just seems to be so much money flowing around that. Uh, that, that they have to end up somewhere. So as you said, you know, baseball cards or, or NFTs or, or something. Well, I, I, I think that we've printed a lot of money yeah. uh, and, I, and it sounds like we're planning on printing a lot more yeah. money. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I think that's um, very untested over time at the rate in which we're doing it. But uh, the history of fiat currencies is that they generally fail. Um, and you can go back hundreds of years uh, and, 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 and look at that um, uh, out there. So that, that part in itself worries me um whether uh buying spot stocks is a speculative of buying say nfts or something yeah. along along those lines hopefully not right you know if you're buying into a company that's paying out dividends over uh uh times so let's say a more traditional uh cash flow generating uh company you may not like the yield that you earn on that over uh, uh, time, but you know, if your bogey is earning, you know, 0.1% in your bank account, that may not be a crazy uh, uh, strategy for some uh, some people. It is ironic to me that you have people saying that that uh, stocks, or I guess stonks is the online <laughs> yeah. jargon for it, um, only go up because it was it was a little literally only a little bit over a year ago that they went way down. <laughs> so um, you know, you don't you don't have, it's not like you have to go back to. I, I realize that I, I, I might be an old fogey talking about 2008, 2009 yeah. at this point, but but like. Um, you only have to go back, you know, 15 months to yeah. find a period of time that stocks went down quite a bit, right? Yeah. And so, so stocks themselves are, are speculative or can be speculative. And when you own something with leverage, you know, or through option form, which seems to have become popular these days, you're compounding that that leverage. But um, if you buy something without leverage and it's got cash flow attached to it or the expectation of future cash flow that's reasonable and you own it for a long period of time, you know, generations of, of wealth have been created in the United States by doing that. So, you know, again, going back to, to the democratization of, of that, you know, I, I would like many more. You know, I, I think it was uh, it shouldn't have been as hard to uh, maybe uh, buy stocks in the 1990s as, as it was, but that became easier over time and it's become easier today. I think that's generally a good thing for society. I see. Uh, so you mentioned that you were very excited about uh a lot of the investment opportunities as a distressed debt investor because there are more events coming up. Uh, what are some of the things you're more nervous about? Was uh, uh, some of these frauds what you're, you're nervous about? Maybe inflation? What are some of the exciting and nervous things? Well, I think that there's a lot unknown. And, and I would say, you know, our, our excitement is not just as a distressed debt investor, but also as an event-driven investor. Yeah. Right? We've got a big risk arbitrage business uh, as well, which is very, very busy. Um, at the moment. Um, so th th there's a lot of unknowns, right? And so in a, in a normal world, there are always political unknowns, right? There's often a new political party in power somewhere in the world. They're often doing things that are different than what people did um, before them. And so you, ha you have healthy doses of that around the world today, including obviously in the United uh, uh, States. But um, what the world will look like post pandemic is kind of a new unknown, right? And, you know, where you compare uh, administrations and you could go back, you know, in uh, 200 plus years of American history and compare uh, uh, this administration to prior administrations before them and how things responded, there really isn't any good input into, uh, 
you know, looking at things like what's travel going to look like for the next 18 months? What's travel going to look like five years from now? You know, I've got a lot of friends who who travel a lot for business who say they're going to travel less. Is that really true? When your competitor starts traveling to see your client, all of a sudden, are you going to get off of Zoom and start traveling yourself to yeah. see your client? Like, how long does that does that go on to um, to happen? Right. And no one really knows the answers to these uh, questions, but we're all going to find out together over uh, uh, over time. And and. You know, again, like in in the world of troubled companies, you know, we're typically dealing with businesses more on the margin, right, versus dealing with businesses um, that are in their sweet spot, right? So retail would be an obvious example, right? The retail landscape was changing dramatically prior to the pandemic, right? Uh, the pandemic did a lot of damage to the retail landscape. It doesn't mean it's going to be better or worse when we get out of the pandemic, but we're still sort of figuring that out, right? Um, you mentioned this word unknown, which I think would be very exciting to talk about because I guess the broader question of what we've been talking about for the past 20 minutes was uh, decision making when things are uncertain, uh, when, when things seem risky, especially there's a lot of uh, unknown unknowns uh, in the markets, in the world. So how do you, I guess, forecast for the future or make decisions when, when moments seem uh, extremely unknown. And also there are obviously events such as the pandemic or the GameStop situation that don't seem to fit in very perfectly into traditional risk modeling. Well, uh, I, 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 I would say a couple of different things. So first of all, um, as a firm with a large risk arbitrage business, I, I still have this risk arbitrage mentality, which, which is you take every investment and you try to narrow it down to what are you going to make if it's successful? What are you going to lose if it's not successful? And what's the probability of success, right? And if you can figure out those three things over time, and, and each of them requires sp calculations, right, and a lot of guesswork sometimes, um, <laughs> you, you, you can forecast what, how you're going to do in your investments over time if you, if, you, if you play the game over a long period of time and you assume your probabilities and your upside and your downside are correct, right? So I think during a crisis like COVID, you had to look at several possibilities as opposed to uh, one possibility, and you had to be thoughtful about... Um, probability of um, success and an upside downside in each of those scenarios. And, and I would say I think a common mistake that investors made with the benefit of hindsight during the crisis yeah. is they massively underestimated their probabilities of success, right? So they might have been right in their upside versus their downside, but they massively underestimated their probabilities of success. So, um, uh, and the market, by the way, caught up to that much quicker than a lot of smart investors did. There were still investors in June last year who were saying to sell the stock market, and uh, uh, the market, the, you know, the market is a very powerful force into itself. And so, yeah. the, the collective wisdom was actually very Stronger. smart, very, very smart in that uh, in, in that era, right? So, um, so that that's number one we have to look at. But number two, you still need to have risk management rules as to how you construct uh, portfolios because there are just things that are unknown. Or quite frankly, things you're going to get wrong, right? And so basic risk management rules are things like what's the maximum percentage that you want of any one investment in your uh, uh, portfolio? Or they are how much money you're willing to lose in any one place, right? Because, you know, weird things do happen. Things happen that are out of your control. You know, there's this great old saying that um, markets can remain irrational longer yeah. than you can remain solvent. Um, and yeah. so... Uh, and then, by the way, those risks become compounded if you use leverage in your model. Our yeah. model generally does not use uh, leverage, at least in our in our hedge funds and in our private equity funds. We have only leverage on specific assets as opposed to leverage generally on the on the portfolios. And so that's how we generally control uh, uh, for it, right? I generally want to be a cash buyer of things in bad times as opposed to a buyer on leverage. It's a lot easier if things go down to buy them if you're buying them with cash versus buying them with uh, uh, leverage. It's just a much, much harder thing to do. Um, but fundamentally, like you have to have risk rules and you have to um, uh, set them, right? I have the benefit of this is what I do uh, professionally. So it's kind of something I've put together over a long period of time. But I think there's plenty of literature out there on this uh, um, as well. You know, it's interesting. It's it's um, th there, there is a lot of the old Bear Stearns firm in the DNA of Davidson Kepner. Uh, Marvin Davidson, who was our original founder, uh, was one of the senior executives there. And there was an old um, risk line at Bear Stearns, which is no one ever wants to exceed their risk limits for things they don't like. You know, so it basically means this one wants to exceed their risk limits. By definition, they really like it. But you have to stay very disciplined to your risk limits because that's when you can really get into trouble. It, it seems that maybe because of a lot of the structural forces that we talked about and also the Federal Reserve policies, risk-taking behaviors and leverages have become 
more, much more prevalent and easier to access uh, during the pandemic. So are, are you somewhat worried about uh, the direction overall markets are, are headed? Well, you know, look, it, it's, it's not clear to me if there's a large number of people taking a small amount of risk or a small number of people taking a large amount of, uh, 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 of risk, right? I mean, again, I, I think there has to be some level of individual responsibility in terms of what people do in their own, uh, in, in, in their own portfolios. I mean, uh, borrowing is borrowing, no matter how you look at it. And, and in options themselves come with embedded uh, leverage uh, uh, to them. Um, but um, I, I do think, in general, allowing more people to have control over their financial futures is, is a good thing, as I said earlier. So, uh, uh, you are obviously a very, very successful investor. But so, over the two, three decades of your career, uh, as you observe the markets evolve and the, all, the, all the ebbs and flows, uh, do you think humans in general are, are good at forecasting or? or uh, thinking about uncertainty or dealing with uncertainty, because a lot of people say uh, sometimes people have a tendency to stick uh, with risk management models, or sometimes they're not very good at entertaining uh, black swan events or fat tail events. Uh, do, do you have any thoughts on, on some of these well, matters? I mean, look, you know, as humans, we're emotional, we're, we're not perfect, right? So, um, you know, I, I, I guess compared to what in terms of are humans yeah. good at it? I mean, I, I, would, I would say computers aren't perfect at predicting things. Yeah. Uh, 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 either, right? But I, but I think humans certainly can be very good at it. I mean, one, one of my adages for our investment analysts is it's important to kind of get your head out of the model, right? And so a model can only take you so far in terms of looking at a particular company or a particular um, situation. You have to get out and, and, and see the big picture. And kind of like I alluded to earlier about having that free time to think about things, like, you know, I, I think as you as you live your life and you talk to people and you go out there, and I, I also encourage our team to have conversations with everybody, you know, talk, talk to the person driving your, your Uber, talk to the, uh, uh, the, the, the the clerk at the grocery store about how busy they are. You know, uh, you can gather tidbits of information. Now you have to worry not to overweight any one tidbit of information that you get, but it actually can help paint a really strong mosaic over uh, uh, over time. Um, you know, there is this theory these days, I guess, that um, because of algorithms, we, we, we all wind up with like just hearing people parrot back to us what we believe already. <laughs> um, but that's something you can easily solve with human interaction, which is to just ask I people see. questions and have conversations and, and try to learn from everybody around you, no matter who they are or, or, or what they're doing, because I think everyone has something to teach you. Um, uh, so, you know, again, that's part of my, you know, to our team, like get out of your, you need the model, right? That's a basic thing, but get out of your model and look at the bigger, uh, uh, bigger picture as opposed to um, just being focused on exactly what the numbers say. What are some of the sources uh, from which you gather information? What are you reading, listening to podcasts or, or something? I still read a lot. I, I read four or five newspapers every day. Um, I've got a number of magazines um, that I read too, although the printed magazine business really is tough yeah. these days. And so I, I'd say the majority of the articles you want up reading are online uh, in, in, in those uh, uh, forms. Very, very few of what I read directly is investing specific. A lot of it is more generally uh, uh, focused. And then you know, I go out. I have a lot of lunches and coffees yeah. and, and and things like that with uh, people and, and and talk to people, all to try to gain uh, uh, perspective. And then in in normal times, which is something I miss the most, I, I travel out of the New York region quite a bit because I find that whether you're going to different parts of the country or different parts of the globe, um, you get different perspectives on things. And you know, in some ways, when I go to London, I get a very different perspective. But in other ways, I might get a very different perspective going to Florida than when I get going to London, right? And so you have to actually go uh, to a lot of different places to do that. So I, so I think travel is very helpful as well. How do you filter out all the noises? Because there's so much information bombarding at everybody these days. And especially, I guess, financial journalism is every day you, over, you turn on CNBC or Bloomberg. It's like, well, markets go down or up. or what? Everybody has a story. You know, and, I, I guess yeah. even going back to... to Princeton in high school, I was always very good at multitasking. And so there's definitely a multitasking element uh, uh, to this that's helpful. Look, you, you want to block out and reach your conclusion. On the other hand, you have to consistently absorb new information as well because things change, right? And so one of the, especially if you're doing public markets investing, one of the important parts is to um, understand when you're wrong and, and, and um, do something about it, right? You know, if you buy a private company and you know you realize you made a bad investment like you're kind of in salvage mode at that point you know if you buy a public stock and you realize yeah. you're wrong about something you can click two buttons and sell it right but you have to have the mental state to 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 do that you know there's an old saying in, in investing that investors you know 
uh, uh, keep their losers too long and don't ride their winners when you yeah. obviously want to do the opposite of that, right? And so, um, you know, for me, it's like, you know, keeping an open mind matters too. So e even like when you've made your mind up, so to speak, like you have to be willing to, to change it. Maybe philanthropy is also a big uh, uh, component that uh, helps you uh, uh, diversify your worldview and, and, and spend your time on. I, I believe you are involved in a wide range of philanthropic philanthropic endeavors, excuse me, uh, and being a member of the Board of Trustees of Leadership Enterprise for Diverse America, a member uh, of the Board of Trustees of New York Public Library. W would you mind telling us a little bit more about about these? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have gotten a lot of ancillary benefits to my involvement yeah. uh, with philanthropy, but, but I wouldn't really describe that as the root cause of it. I, I, I mean, I think we have to remember how fortunate we all yeah. are to live in this country, to have the opportunities um, we have. I've been fortunate to be in an industry that's created financial uh, 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 success. And, and I think our society and our democracy only works if, if we all give back, right? And everyone gives back in the way um, in which they're able uh, uh, to. And so, you know, th through philanthropy, I do meet a lot of really interesting uh, 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 people, but you also deal with real world challenges. I mean, the first... Um, philanthropy I was really involved with at a granular level is an organization called Donors Choose, where um, I was one of the first backers uh, of the organization and a longtime board member. And that's an organization where you had, um, you know, an idea to fund public school projects around the country, teacher by teacher, project by project. And that was something that the internet really enabled. So it was probably one of the first crowdsourcing really uh, organizations on the internet. And so um, they approached me, and sometimes it's fortuity, that the first hire of that organization was one of my friends from high school. Um, but uh, when I met the founder, Charles uh, uh, Best, I was super excited about what they were doing because um, the public school district I grew up in, which I would describe as an upper middle class uh, public school uh, uh, district, had started a similar organization a few years earlier just for that school district. And my thought was, well, that's great that East Brunswick can afford to do that and that they're willing to do that, but wouldn't it be wonderful if kids around the country, maybe who come from lower income districts, could access the same uh, tools. So I really bought into uh, what Charles was trying to do. And, you know, 30% compound in annual growth for 20 years later, Donors Choose now gives away $150 million a year to public school teachers a few hundred dollars um, uh, at a time, right? And so that was just a really powerful uh, lesson for me, really uh, living through that and seeing how the organization grew uh uh, organically, you know, more recently in the last, uh, you know, 10 years, it's been involvements in places like Princeton and the New York Public Library. I mean, my wife and I have been very education focused on our um, uh, uh, philanthropy. Um, it's not exclusively what we um, what we do. And in more recent years, we've probably been a little bit more New York focused uh, as well. And I think in particular, New York is in a time of need uh, right now. But um, in general, you know, we want to make sure everyone has a chance, everyone's got equal um, opportunity. And so whether it's organizations like LIDA, which really help to identify very high performing students from uh, low income and first gen uh, backgrounds to something like the public uh, library where I think something like 37 million people a year use the public libraries in New York uh, uh, City. It's more than all the other museums and all the sports events in New York combined. Um, and it's just a gateway, especially if people um, don't speak English, don't speak English uh, that well, or maybe can't afford Wi-Fi, things we would consider to be basics that there are more people than you think wouldn't have. I think it's just so important to provide that for people free of charge and an easy, accessible um uh, way. So, you know, I, I actually feel like I've gotten far more out of my philanthropy than I ever would have intended. But I also just think it's, it's you know, it's incumbent on all of us to give back. Uh, there's a very famous uh, a philosophy professor at Princeton named Peter Singer. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's a big advocate for uh, effective altruism, uh, m meaning you should spend your, your dollar to maximize the impact of your dollar uh, based on the efficacy of the projects and so on. So uh, w when you pick your uh, your projects or, or places that you choose to give, do you often sort of uh, think about um, uh, your, your, your impact, of the, the scope of your impact, but also how you can add uh, to the organizations to help them maximize their impacts? You know, it's funny. I, I, I actually think about my, my uh, philanthropy a little bit in the way of how I think about um, investing, yeah. right? And so there's some philanthropy you, don't, you do because you know people involved in the organization and you want to be supportive of a human being. Like hopefully yeah. you like the cause, but you want to be supportive of a human being. But, you know, there's philanthropy that I do that's probably lower 
ROI and philanthropy, I do that's <laughs> yeah, higher yeah. ROI, right? Yeah. So if I'm going to do lower ROI philanthropy, I want it to be like a rock solid organization that's going to be that's been was around well before I gave the money and is going to be around well after I gave the money, right? And so you may not, you know, it's very hard to have metrics like of how many people you serve per dollar or what they actually get out of it. Yeah. But like, you know, I I know the money is going to be like very very well spent, right? On the other hand, you know, an organization like Donors Choose, when I was started to support it, it was a startup, right? So it was very possible that the money was going to be very poorly spent. As it turned out, the ROI and that investment was off the charts yes. uh, high, but there was no guarantee of success. And I certainly have supported other organizations um, that have not had this level of success that they've uh, they've had. And so I try to spread it around a little bit. And you know, um, you also can size your bets smaller because you know an amount of money that's still what I would view as a very nice donation to a charitable organization, but smaller than you know, or uh, donations you might make to larger organizations will be moves the needle that much further for that organization. And that was kind of like the idea of donors choose, like that three hundred dollars to that teacher, because that teacher knows where that money is going to go to work. And by the way, you can see on their website exactly how the teacher is going to spend the money. And they're going to send you photos all online of how they did. And the kids may write you thank you notes if you give more than a certain amount of money as well. Like, as a donor, you know where the money went. The teacher, like, went through the effort of posting that site, so they must think it's important, right? And so, you know, again, it's kind of hard to exactly measure ROIs, but presumably the ROI on um, that donation was very, very high, right? And so that, that that's kind of my focus is to do a little bit of both um, uh, with our um, – philanthropy, you know, the great majority of what we do is in the United States. It's not exclusively in the United States. Um, I think it's, it's harder for me to monitor things that are outside the United States versus in the United uh, 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 States. But but generally, we like to do a little bit of both. It seems that a lot of times it's so, so, um, so many social entrepreneurs these days, it's very hard to choose from and, and uh, uh, maybe a hit or miss. It basically depends on the situation. Yeah, I, I think that there are more. The fact that there are more social entrepreneurs is, is a good thing, yeah. not a bad thing. I'm very supportive of that uh, concept. What you do hope is that, um, as you know, in in, in the um, for profit world, right? What happens is you have a lot of small companies doing uh, similar things, and they ultimately amalgamate into a smaller number of larger companies with more efficiencies to them. And so you, you, you hope that uh, not-for-profit organizations find that way. You know, my experience has been it's very hard culturally for not-for-profits to merge, uh, different than for-profits where it's sort of um, a much more common thing. So p- perhaps you'll see more efficiencies driven in the not-for-profit world um, with that. But I do think that actually social entrepreneurship in, um, in the not-for-profit world is, is an amazing thing. Uh, it seems that inequality again, has become a central issue during this COVID-19 pandemic. And the Biden administration has a very forefront agenda to become more egalitarian, anti-poverty through a lot of the stimulus measures. Uh, I, I guess my, my question would be, how do you think successful businessmen like you uh, or the business community in general could sort of do more, either through philanthropy or through other measures uh, to address some of the social issues that we see today? Well, you know, look, I, I, I go back to equality of opportunity, right? You know, I had the fortune, you know, I didn't grow up rich, but I had the fortune to go to what at the time was a very high performing public school district. And I had the fortune of having parents who chose to live in that community because it had a a uh, very high performing uh, public school district where there was a number of communities around uh, me that didn't have that public school district. But I was a public school kid until I came to, um, to to Princeton, right? And so, you know, the reality is that not all public schools around the country are created equal. Some are vastly worse than, than other ones are. You know, I would like to imagine a future where every child is uh, – entitled and, and has access to that that schooling, right? I, I don't think we're going to be able to uh, legislate a quality of outcome. Um, I think we can do a better job of um, a quality of opportunity that we're doing as a society uh, uh, today. And so that is where, um, you know, my wife and I are, are uh, dedicating a you know, substantial portion of our resources to making that happen. You know, my wife was also a product of the public schools and a full scholarship student in college. And so, um, you know, she lived this even more than uh, I did uh, coming to the United States as an immigrant. So, um, um, you know, I I think that that basic premise, like we're still not achieving or are close to it. And so um, we're doing our best through things like, you know, donors choose and the public library uh, to even the playing field. 
what are some of the other up and coming exciting projects that, that you would like to use this platform to tell more people about either, either in, in education or other uh, philanthropic areas? I literally just funded uh, today something called the Ripple uh, uh, Center where um, one of my friends from high school yeah. uh, is a superstar educator uh, in northern uh, New Jersey uh, and Wonderful. he has this plan to build, build, uh, better educate social entrepreneurs. Uh, that you um, that you spoke about previously, and so I think social entrepreneurship is important. I think uh, the individual running this organization is an absolute superstar. He was a leading educator for a very long period of time, and so um, on that alone, I'm backing it. But um, I think the concept is is great. Um, you know, there's definitely a premise in philanthropy of of low touch where, you know, how many people can you service for any given dollar? Yeah. You know, I would go back to sometimes it's better to have high touch and to choose the right people and then to put more resources into them. And the multiplying impact will be from what they do for the world. Uh, you know, Princeton kind of has that model, right? We spend an incredible amount of money per student uh, uh, here on the theory that these students will change the world and, you know, be in the service of uh, the humanity. Um, and um, that's kind of his concept on a much, much smaller, smaller scale. Uh, so that's what I'm very excited about. Absolutely. So you brought up Princeton. Maybe we can end the interview on some of the Princeton related questions. Uh, I didn't get to ask you at the very beginning uh, when we talked about Princeton, some of the courses or, or uh, faculty professors uh, that had some impact on you or, or even friendships. Yeah. I mean, so um, as I mentioned earlier, I was in the School of Public and International yeah. Affairs. The, the curriculum in that school was a little bit looser then than it is today. Although I think it's still pretty interdisciplinary and what it allows you to uh, uh, to do. So there were a couple of basic uh, economics courses I, I, I took. The offerings in, in actually finance are far better today than they were in the 1990s because there was no finance program here in the 1990s. But I had a course in accounting, which was taught by Uwe Reinhardt, which was legendary, yeah. uh, and a course in uh, um, uh a corporate finance taught by Bert Malkuel, uh, yeah. who's kind of the random walk down Wall Street yes. uh, uh, person. Um, and those were both great. But it was other courses. You know, I did a certificate in American Studies, which I loved. Um, I actually have one academic credit to my name, um, which is an American Studies paper that my professor encouraged me to get published, which I did. Wonderful. Uh, which is on the treatment of uh, Joe DiMaggio in yeah. the popular press in the 30s and, and 40s. So it was really a very early ethnic studies uh, 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 piece. And so I'm very proud of, of that. And, and I don't know if it's 10 or 15, some small but limited number of academic citations <laughs> I have uh, for that one piece of academic work I, I did. Um, there was a course about um, the American suburbs um, in the Woodrow, in the school. What is it about? School of Public and National <laughs> Affairs um, th th that I took that was great um, and it gave me perspective because I grew up in the suburbs so the suburbs were kind of all I knew in the 1990s and, and it, it gave me um, a perspective on what the cities were like until the 50s or 60s and which is much more like what the cities are like today because uh, the suburb 1996 might be a little bit peak suburb <laughs> in terms of where things were in this uh, uh, in this country. But I would say my experience here was as much about the people. I mean, I still have a lot of really close friends from uh, uh, Princeton from my time here. And I have a lot of really close friends from the Princeton Alumni Network uh, as well. So people I met uh, along the way after graduating uh, from school. It's, it's a very special place. I guess one question I didn't quite get to ask you about, since you're also on the board of, of Princeton, and I think a lot of the students on campus are, are talking about this, is that we're kind of seeing uh, some doubts on, you know, quote, quote unquote, the, the elite education. Michael Sandel from Harvard wrote about the tyranny of meritocracy and, and, and so on. And we're seeing, uh, we previously discussed democratization of finance, and maybe there's also democratization of education when with online schools and, you know, especially COVID exacerbated the trend of more, uh, you know, online classes from, from universities to, to people and giving them certifications and so on. Uh, do you think a school like Princeton, you know, w which only takes, you know, 1,400 kids a year or and so on, would, would play a, a larger role or, or a smaller role in, in the well, broader? Well, I, I, I would say a couple of things. And, you know, look, I, um, uh, so, so, so first of all, I, I would not doubt my education if yeah. I was a Princeton uh, senior right now. I, I think that... Um, uh, you, you've gotten an amazing education, and I, and I hope many of you will do great things um, with it. I, I wouldn't rely exclusively on my education, right? So, so first of all, I, I, I think learning is a lifelong venture. It doesn't start with your time at Princeton or end with your time uh, at Princeton. And there's a lot of different perspectives in the world, and you have to be open to them. And so I would go back to that groupthink uh, comment, right? You know, you can't only be concerned with what people at Princeton 
think, you have to make it from what people in the world think. And there are there are parts of New Jersey even where people might think very differently about things than they think about them at Princeton. And you have to understand that and empathize, empathize right, uh, with different uh, 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 viewpoints and not just uh, uh, dismiss it. That's number one. Number two, I would never judge anybody in society based upon what school they went to. There's many different uh, uh, paths to success. As you point out, there's many great ways to get a great education, far easier today than it was in 1996, but it was true in 1996 um, as, as well. And so some of the most successful people I know uh, in, in finance did not go to particularly great schools or schools that were not thought of as great at the time. Um, but they still managed to succeed. And, and I know plenty of people from Princeton who were not that successful in their professional uh, careers, right? And so, you know, you, you can't rely upon that exclusively, but I don't think that under, I don't, I don't want to understate, I think, what a great education I feel like people are getting uh, here. It's, it's, just, it's just one part of a much larger mosaic. Absolutely. A any favorite Princeton swag or Princeton's uh, reunion story that, that, that you have? I know you're very heavily involved in the uh, alum alumni community here yeah, at Princeton. Yeah, I mean, I, I enjoy coming back to school for reunions, but, yeah. I, but I actually also enjoy coming back to campus when it's quiet yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> as well. Reunions is a major, amazing experience, but it's also overwhelming with the sheer number of people uh, uh, are, who are here. Um, I guess my favorite Princeton swag is the stuff that's like undiscovered, right? Yeah. And so, you know, I still have a decent amount of um, stuff from when I was here, but a lot of it's like sat in a box in my parents' house for 20 years. <laughs> and when you pull it out and you find something from uh, when you're here, it's actually kind of fun to uh, yeah. uh, uh, to cart it, um, uh, cart it out. I occasionally buy stuff online to eBay. Sometimes I steal <laughs> stuff from uh, Princeton. So I've got some like beer steins from 120 years ago, which are wow. kind of fun on <laughs> my uh, – desk at uh, uh desk at work um but um you know still enjoy the trip to hoagie haven uh, yes, yes. sandwich as, shop as well so the um the pizza shop i used to go to when i was here i think it's been replaced twice uh or at least once uh since i graduated but hoagie haven is still here and i think probably even a little bit bigger and better than when i was yeah. uh here which is uh, which is great yeah, they don't offer the late late nights like 3 a.m they're not open at 3 a.m anymore because usually there's a big student crowd whatever they, they go out at saturday night and they I, go I, I was gonna say with the, with the that, benefit <laughs> of hindsight and health that might be a good thing <laughs> yes, yes yes very much so because of the pandemic any anything uh, interest interesting fact about princeton that you might care to share that other people might not know about or, or any interesting story uh, about princeton uh no, I mean, look, so, I, I felt very fortunate to be yeah. here. As I kind of said, yeah. even though I grew up in the area, it's not like I grew up dying to go here. Yeah, it was yeah. just when I really did the, the work on universities, uh, I decided this is where I wanted to uh, 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 to be. You know, I had a really enjoyable experience uh, uh, here. I feel like I got a nice taste for being an athlete uh, uh, here with not having that been my entire experience. So I think I've, I've had a good sense of both the athletic portion of Princeton and the non-athletic portion of, uh, uh, of, 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 of Princeton. And, you know, being back here always brings back uh, uh, memories. And, and, and even though my time here was not perfect, uh, they're very fond memories. Awesome. Anything you would uh, do uh, all over again or would you redo if, uh, if you were given a chance to, to be an undergrad again? You know, look, there, there are always uh, sliding door like things like if you had gone path a versus yeah. path path b i will say i was a very strong math student in um in high school and i had a really big interest in public policy and i kind of got burned out in math and sciences uh junior and senior year of high school even though i was quite strong in those areas and so my freshman year i really avoided um you know i, I took quite frankly easier science courses to fulfill yeah. requirements um and um, didn't really go down that path. And my and my junior year, I started again. So I took CS126, which was much less popular back then than it yeah. is today. And I took through differential equations and through the engineering school. And I kind of realized my junior year that it was sort of too late. And so I stopped uh, I stopped doing that. And so I, I, I have no regrets in the sense that um, uh, I, I don't, I'm not, like I'm very happy with the path I wound yeah. up um, on. But I, I could see why a student today might not make those decisions and yeah. might stick with the math and science uh, uh, track that I was on in high school um, my freshman um, year, even if they ultimately decide to go into a career that doesn't directly require it. So you would recommend students to push themselves very hard here and, and well, take I think on the... I, what, what I would say, if I, if I were to critique myself, yeah. um, I would say that um, 
while I thought I was diversifying my course load, my freshman and, and um, sophomore year and trying new things, I wasn't doing that in, um, in an area like uh, math or science where I had shown a lot of proclivity in high school, right? And yeah. by the time I decided to do that, it was sort of too uh, late. I also uh, took on a new language in um, – uh, at, at Princeton, I, I was a very poor language student in high school, and that didn't change coming to Princeton. So that also was extra yeah. coursework I probably could have uh, avoided to have time to to do that. But you know, it's it's um it's like playing golf. You know, even if you shoot par, you're gonna say, why didn't I shoot one better than par? Like uh, I'm very happy with the body of work I took here, yeah. but I could always critique after the fact and think about things I could have done different. Wonderful. Well, the name of our show is Policy Punchline, so we have a tradition at the end of the show. We always ask our guests, what would your policy punchline be? Or what would uh, the punchline for this interview be? Uh, the punchline for this interview would be, first of all, I think this is an amazing program. Uh, <laughs> you all have this. And, and, and kudos, Thank you. <laughs> kudos to coming up uh, for this. And I hope this survives well beyond your yeah. graduation as a program here because it's a great idea. Look, I think equality of opportunity really matters a lot. I mean, it's very much in the in the forefront, I think, of American society today. But it shouldn't be a new thing. It's always mattered. It should continue to matter. And so I, I push really hard on education. Um, the fact that um, the Internet has helped to democratize education is a really good thing. Um, but we need to make sure that our entire society has equal access to it. That's a wonderful punchline. And, and Tony, thank you so much for joining me today for discussing such a wide range of topics. Uh, it's a great honor to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening today. You may find this interview on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or any of your preferred podcasting platform. Please rate and review us. I really appreciate uh, you listening. I also think this is a quite a special moment to share with Tony here uh, because this is not only the first uh, interview we have in person and in studio since the pandemic, but also probably the last interview I'll do in the studio uh, as a Princeton student. Uh, I want to thank our studio technician, uh, Dan, over there for, for helping us over the years. And thank you for all your support uh, over the years. Thank you so much for listening today, and we'll see you next time. You've been listening to Policy Punchline, a podcast generously supported by the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance at Princeton University. We would also like to encourage you to follow other podcasts produced by Princeton University, such as Politics and Polls by the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Policy Punchline is intended to be informational only and does not reflect nor represent the views of Princeton University or the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance. For more information on subscription, donation, volunteering, or contact, please visit policypunchline.com. Thank you again for listening.